Hey Internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. This episode of Worldview Everlasting is brought to you by the letter awesome. The numbers sweet action and issues etc. Talk radio for the thinking Christian. Issues etc. Org. And on this week's episode of Greek Tuesday, Philippians chapter 3. Kind of verses 4b to 14, but kind of all of it because it all kind of needs to go together. So, you don't want to miss it. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, well. Stick around. <laughs> So we're continuing in the Lectio Continuum, the ongoing readings from the three-year lectionary series in the epistles, and we're really getting like a good look at all of the book of Philippians. Most of chapter one, a lot of chapter two, a chunk of chapter three, and then next week chapter four. And what we're finding is that while this certainly is the epistle of joy, if we want to call it that, the joy that Paul talks about throughout the epistle isn't the sort of happiness of just come what may, I feel great, but more a constant redirecting of of the Christian faith to the source of relief that we have from our suffering, even as that suffering continues, understanding that the suffering in its utmost is not the suffering of like, you know, just having a terrible, horrible, no good very bad day. It's the suffering of, of being a sinner and knowing it, that the source of that joy, that relief, that comfort, is the cross of Jesus Christ, and the promise that because of that cross, he is returning again in order to raise us from the dead and take us to a world without any suffering at all. No suffering of our own personal sin, which will lead to no suffering in general. And today's chapter is going to be not any different at all. In fact, at the heart and core of it is going to be Paul's emphasis that all things mean nothing when compared to the fact of Jesus' death and resurrection in our place. He's going to get so brazen as to even kind of use some Greek curse language. Bang, bang, We'll talk about that when we get there. But what you got to be aware of is that the standard way this is read in the English text, and the translation reflects us a little, although it doesn't have to, but it, it kind of does, the way we've learned to read it, is that what's going on here is Paul is telling you to clap along. And as a result of who Jesus is to like get busy being a happy Christian and just like pursuing this like power driven glory faith all the time. Because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's the thing that gives him the greatest joy this morning. I do up. But then what you find is that those verses that read that way in the English are at odds with the other verses that are like in the same paragraph and they don't really line up well. This has a lot more to do with our trouble with English than it does with the Greek text or even the translation work. Like what English has come to mean because of the theology that you know, has been formed in the language. What do I mean by that? Well, when Luther was the first one to translate the Bible into German, he sort of codified the meaning of the biblical text in German by codifying the language itself for its use. The same thing happened in English. English with the King James Version and later the Revised Standard Version. So that a lot of our words in English have their meanings and mean what they mean because of the theology that was put or read sometimes into them in that initial translation. So English words like church or even like joy have been formed in their meaning not so much by what they meant in the Bible itself but by what the Reformed assumptions, you know, the Calvinist slash moving towards Protestant assumptions that were read into it. Same thing happened with Lutheran assumptions in Germany. Now, the thing is, you know, I would say that the Lutheran assumptions were the actual biblical ones and the Calvinist ones were not so much, although sometimes they certainly are. A good example of where all this happens is in verses 9, 10, and 11 of chapter 3, where Paul is at pains to demonstrate that he has faith alone in a righteousness that's not his, but in the righteousness that is Christ's, right, that's been promised to him, and yet then goes on to say that he strives by any means possible to make it his own. Well, that would be to, like, try to make it your own by yourself to have a faith in your own ability to grab that righteousness, which is just like, that's the opposite of what he's trying to say. That just doesn't make any sense at all. What he's trying to say is I got nothing, and so all that I want to do ever, all that I hope for is to not have anything in myself. Not that by some grasping of suffering I can like bind myself to Jesus. And even there, in verse 10 where it says that I might share in his sufferings, well, you literally have the words koinonia and pathema, like literally the words holy communion and passion, right? That I might 
might have communion with his passion. Well, that's a little bit different than like sharing in his sufferings, right? As somehow I've got this mystical reality that I gotta go out and suffer to really be a Christian. Or that I pursue the truth that by Holy Communion itself, I have fellowship in the body and blood of Christ that in fact did have passion on the cross for me slash you, right? See how that is like, like two totally different things, but we don't translate koinonia as communion. We translate it as fellowship, which everybody in English reads as buddy, buddy, kind of like we feel like it, right? We have fellowship with each other because we're f so you got that kind of stuff going on and it can dilute the actual relief, the actual joy you can get from this letter when you find out that all of the relief is simply the promise of Christ's cross and its sufficiency for you. Let's see if we can do that today, yeah? So the point of the whole chapter is summed up in verse one. Finally, my brothers, translated in English, rejoice in the Lord Jesus alone. Now if it's be happy in the Lord Jesus alone, it's like, oh my gosh, that's kind of hard to do. But if it's find your final and ultimate relief in Jesus, like not in yourself, but in Jesus, Jesus. It's like, oh, well, I don't have to do that. That just is Jesus doing it, right? Oh, that's kind of a nice thing. It, it's gospel. Yeah, that's right. It's gospel. Finally, brothers, here's the truth. You can find relief in Jesus. Jesus is relief for your sins. He goes on to say that these things that I'm writing to you are not idle thoughts. <laughs> I'm not wasting my time. Sometimes translated as, it's not a burden for me to say this again to you. Instead, these things are your certainty. These words about who Jesus is and what he's done are your confidence. Against this, some pretty harsh language in verse two. Watch out for the dogs. Yeah. Yeah, practically canine in Greek. Watch out for the workers of evil. Watch out for the mutilators. Now, what's he talking about? Well, he's gonna talk about in a moment, those who would say that you need to be circumcised in order to be a Christian, throwing a hat tip to that kind of common argument that was going on in first century Christianity about the old Hebraic codes and laws, which was really just a veneer, a cover for the constant attack on the church, which is that yes, Jesus has saved you, but you also have to complete this justification by doing some more now. Whatever that is, is, whether that's repenting, whether that's being righteous, whether it's having enough faith or the right kind of authentic faith, it's always going to point you back to you. Let's open our heart to him today. That's what he means by the dogs here. Those who would steal from you the relief that Jesus alone is enough. I gave it to the cat. <laughs> Watch out for those dogs, for those who mutilate the gospel with their works. Grace brings a commandment that he enables you to perform. Run <laughs> away! For we Christians, he says, are the true circumcision. And by that, he means we're the true Israel. Like all the promises of Israel weren't about the Jewish nation, but about those who have faith in the Messiah to be sufficient for the overcoming of the devil, according to all the promises, all the way through the various covenants of the Old Testament. The true ones for whom God fights. That's what Israel means, the one who God fights for. Yes, it can mean who God fights with. And that actually is what he does, is he fights for you by fighting against you, by killing you and raising you in Jesus. We are that, we Christians, who in Christ have died and yet Behold, we live buried with him in baptism, all that good stuff. Those who by means of God's spirit boast in nothing but Jesus, right? As he says in 1 Corinthians, I will only boast in the Lord. The foolishness of the cross, knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified. Putting no confidence in, now it says in the Greek, especially the flesh, this is Paul's code language for the sinful you. The you who is still there, who is tied to your sin. Putting no confidence in yourself, trusting that in Christ, yourself is redeemed. That's like full on hardcore gospel there, right? at the start, right? Hey brothers, find relief nowhere but in Jesus and watch out for anybody who would try to turn your confidence back to you. Boast in Christ alone. What he's done, not what he's doing in you now, what he did for you on the cross and what he's coming again to do on the last day, which is what Paul's going to emphasize here now in the next paragraph. As he also says, after, he will emphasize that if anybody could boast in himself, like nobody has a better ticket than Paul does. Verse 4, you know that of all people, I could put confidence in myself. If anybody in the world thinks that he could have confidence in himself, I got more. I got more. I was circumcised on the eighth day, according to the actual Levitical codes. I was born of the bloodline of Old Testament Israel, into the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, bro. According to the rites of the covenant itself, I was a Pharisee. I mean, nobody was more dedicated to this stuff. According to my zeal for it, I was a persecutor of the church. According to the righteousness of the outward demands of the commandments of God, according to my actual being in front of other people as a good human being who always did what God's word said, I was blameless. 
I was beyond reproach. You could not accuse me of sinning in nothing I'd done my whole life. I looked righteous. Verse 7, but whatever advantage these things were to me, I now consider them a disadvantage before Christ. Yes, insofar as I look at them as an advantage, they are a disadvantage. Even my good works are harmful to my faith when I trust them for my salvation. And so, yes, I consider such things disadvantage before Christ compared to the surpassing value of the knowledge of who Jesus is and what he's done. And then he gets vulgar, just in case you're not getting his point. He pulls out some of that uh, archaic potty language. I consider these things scubula. And I know it sounds like scuba diving, but it's not really what it sounds like at all in the Greek. It is a semi-vulgar expletive regarding fecal matter. What the Holy Spirit? What? And I'll let you put two and two together on your own with that one. Hmm? Oh. I consider these righteousnesses of mine a colorful metaphor for fecal matter. <laughs> so that I might better trust in Christ, right? I, I consider all that I do actually to be the, the dregs of life. Even though I might actually do something good and like it is good, I still consider it the dregs of life so that I can better trust in Christ. Because the last thing I want to do is look at me. I want to look at him. That's where the relief is. And so seeing him to be found on the last day, to be found, I mean, that's what he's talking about. It doesn't say on the last day in the Greek, but that's what he's talking about. To be found on the last day, not having any righteousness of my own, as if it were something I could build or achieve or create, but having the righteousness that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes ex Deo, out of God himself. That righteousness with which faith, like an empty bag, receives, right? The object is put inside of the faith, and the faith only can cling to it. Uh, and we don't even hold it, really, but it enlivens us. It's like a seed planted in the soil. That righteousness that faith receives is to know Jesus and the sufficiency of his resurrection and the communion we have with his passion that granted to us by his death is the fact that we will attain to the resurrection of the dead. And oh, 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 you know, verse 12, hey guys, I haven't gotten this yet, right? My faith is still racked with my own sinful impulses. Not that I've taken hold of this or been completed, but Paul says, I press on, if only to grasp it. Grasp what? My own righteousness? My own good works? No, to grasp what Christ has done and let nothing else be my foundation. Knowing that my faith isn't strong enough to even do that, but I have to still seek to hear it, right? But if I'm going to seek something, what I will seek is to have nothing of my own and be at the foot of the cross. To grasp the fact that I have been grasped by Christ, not because of what I've done, but because that's just what he wants to do for me. Verse 13, brothers, I do not reckon myself to have arrived safely, but this thing I do consider, I reckon, I do grasp, forgetting what lies behind me, who I am, what I've done, ever, wrong or right, good or evil, Hebrew of Hebrews, or scum of the earth, forgetting all of that, straining toward what is to come, which in the context is the last day of Jesus' return, to reckon us righteous, to justify us by his cross, straining for that truth and that hope and that day, knowing that goal, verse 14, I press forward toward the prize of hearing God and Christ say, rise up. Or in the Greek, the upward call of God in Christ. Yeah, the upward call, the call, rise up. I press onward to be at that day and hear God say, rise up, you're mine, I got you. And I try to believe that now, even weekly, even with the flesh still attacking me, knowing that that's what God is preaching to me and knowing that on the last day, I'll believe it so firmly, my body will actually come back out of the ground. Verse 15, therefore, this is our confidence now. This is our completion. This is the fulfillment now that we might think in this way about ourselves and about Jesus. And now here's one of those places where the period was put in the wrong place. And I'm just going to insist on this. The period's in the wrong place. Normally the period goes where what I just said and the next thing's trying to create a new thought as if it's okay to disagree with this, right? So like he's insisting that Jesus alone justifies you. His death and resurrection is our only hope. And then he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if any of you think otherwise, God will also reveal that to you you right? Like, no, oh foolish Galatians who has bewitched you, but eh, if you want to disagree with justification by grace, whatever. God will show you eventually. Not, not so much. Just move a comma and a period, which like in Greek, that's not there for you, right? Like you have to like figure out where those things go and where the phrase attaches and how you translate a word like chi, which can not only mean and, but can also mean even or but, especially when attached to the word a, that means if, if, even, some of you think differently. And then that's the period. This is our maturity as Christians that we might think 
think about Jesus alone as our sufficiency, even though there may be some who say they're Christians and don't think that way, period. And also, yes, even this is what God will reveal to you, period, whoever you are. What follows? This is what we arrive at. This is what we are conformed to. What? Jesus' death and his resurrection, his ascension and his return. Verse 17, brothers, imitate me in this faith that I count everything as loss for the sake of the fact that Jesus is all. And notice, watch closely those amongst the church who walk according to this faith. See the relief that they have, the freedom they have as Christians. Just as you have seen in our own type, you know, those who were there initially as apostles and their example. Paul's not talking about being righteous like him by deeds. Imitate me because I'm so good. He's talking about imitate him by not saying I'm good at all, right? I have nothing but Jesus. Even my best works are filthy rags. Because here's the fact, as he frequently told the Philippians as and he tells them again now, even with tears, even as he cries out in the wailing of morbidity, there are many who walk as enemies of the cross, not by doing evil things, but by not trusting it. Yeah, by trying to trust themselves and said, I have confidence in me. There are many who walk in hostility to the total sufficiency of Christ's justification. He's got tears in his eyes as he's saying this because it's so frustrating that people could stand against the gospel this way. The end of such things which stand against the gospel is their own justly deserved destruction. Trusting in themselves, they're going to get what they deserve. Their God is not the true God, but their heart. Now he says their belly. Yeah, that's right. You know, your insides, your interior, what you are seeking to feel and fill up. That's who you're worshiping. I lift my name on high. Yeah, see? Yeah, mm hmm Such people glory in the very place that they ought to be most ashamed themselves. They think only like the rest of the world already thinks. That to be good, to be better, I must work my way there. But ours is not the reign of the world. Ours is the reign of heaven. Out of which we are expecting the Savior to come again, even Jesus Christ. And he then, on that day that we press toward, will transform the humiliation of living in these bodies by faith alone by the means of his body of glory already vindicated from the dead according to which he has worked his great and glorious power for the salvation of the world and subjected everything once again to himself. Epistle of relief. Epistle of justification. That's true joy, my brothers. Rejoice always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Coming up next week, what does he mean? Well, be relieved at all times by this truth. Like, let nothing stand in your way. Whatever comes at you that hurts, whatever comes at you that you did wrong, whatever comes at you that looks like it's gonna kill you, take relief in this fact. Jesus is coming again and he's got it all covered on that day. Whoo, he has some good stuff and it will preach. You better believe me. Until next time, if you like what we do at Worldview Everlasting here, getting this very rarely heard gospel of the Bible back out into the American evangelical YouTube world, you can always support what we do by sending five bucks a month to the Lutheran Ninja Clan. PayPal makes this really, really easy. You can also like these videos, subscribe to the channel, and forward it into whatever social media sphere you think is popular and cool. Kind of tough to do on Snapchat. Yeah, I know. I don't get it either, but some people think it's really cool. Maybe you can find a way. I don't know. Until next time, this is the king of Scubula himself telling you that the best way to count all things lost is to rock on. <laughs>